So welcome to the Science Circle Roundtable. Uh, please mute the music and media streams before we begin. I don't know if you noticed that this parcel has uh, music playing, so go ahead and please mute that. Um, our discussion today is led by the four questions that were submitted in our roundtable proposal. The structure of the roundtable is to use four directions or compass points to discuss, not present, uh, directions on these topics. The north compass point, what else do you still need to know before you fully commit or are convinced? South compass point, what is your stance or opinion on this topic? What are the pros and cons? East compass point, what is exciting about your topic? And West Compton Point, what is worrisome about your topic and why should one still be cautious? And uh, we have uh, with us uh, here today, um, so I am facing north. Um, so uh, let me see um, our... Um, uh, 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 uh. So, um, to my right is um, uh, Vic Malachek, who is also Phil Youngblood. Um, to my left is Stephen Gazier, um, uh, who is Stephen Zotify. Um, to the north, in front of me, I'm facing north, is Mike Shaw. And to the south behind me is Rob Knopp. And uh, each of them will uh, introduce themselves also uh, with uh, give you a little background information about them also. And uh, with that introduction, I would like to turn to, um, to Vic, um, our East Compass Point, uh, to begin his presentation. Thank you. Okay, hey, hi everybody. I'd like to echo uh, Baragon's sentiment and to welcoming you to our roundtable discussion. And I'd like to thank you for sincerely taking your time out uh, uh, of the day or night in some cases to visit with us. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, the name of the person behind my avatar is Phil Youngblood. But inside Second Life I go by Vic. Um, I think it's kind of funny that uh, my names are switched on the conference schedule because, but I don't really mind because uh, Vic is as much as what I, who I am as uh, Phil is out there in the physical world. In fact, if you Google my Second Life avatar name, uh, one of the first things that you'll see is a link to last year's conference. You will also see uh, links to uh, the university degree program I found and headed or head and plus links to the science circle, which is the subject of our discussion today. Now, before I begin, by the way, is that uh, we enjoy active audiences in the science circle, so we welcome uh, your longer questions and comments at the end. But at least in my part of the presentation, I'll try to answer any questions or comments you have in chat. Um, to start with, if you don't mind, uh, where are you today? In other words, I always find it interesting to see how diverse our audiences are. And I'm in my office at a university in Texas, uh, USA, and I hope that students will read the Do Not Disturb sign on the door for at least 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, so why are we here? Well, uh, for me, my job as an educator and administrator in First Life and my interest in sharing and learning uh, science-related topics as a member of the Science Circle, and presenting here is all intimately related. Uh, the roundtable format uh, has four compass points, um, and Berrigan all uh, told you about them, and I elected to speak for what is exciting about what we do because I think I have the easiest job. Okay, so, um, after all, I know that I don't have to convince you or how exciting Second Life can be. In fact, I'll bet that each one of you remembers your first experiences. 
uh, here and in Second Life when you met somebody or visited somewhere that was surprising, unexpected, or amazing. In fact, what I found even more amazing than what I, uh, as I learned about this site was, or place was that each site and object is the creation of someone's imagination. And it embodies no small amount of time, patience, and even passion. Nor do I need to convince you of the value associated with being able to connect with people from around the world with whom you can share ideas and collaborate. Your very presence here at the VWBP tells me that we have this in common. Within today's silos that describe social media, virtual worlds like Second Life are like a breath of fresh air in which it's easy to have serendipitous encounters with people from many places in the world. Visual worlds today provide us with a way to visualize not only 3D spaces, but also to express abstract ideas. In short, it's a perfect world to fulfill the mission of our group, the Science Circle. So who is the Science Circle? Now, I know uh, we have another speaker who will be talking uh, more of this, so I hope I haven't grabbed uh, his thunder. But uh, the Science Circle is very exciting, and I'd like to, to describe a little bit of my experience with it. The Science Circle began as a uh, forum for a discussion of science-related topics back in 2007. Back then, we sat in a circle and discussed our views as peers, hence the origin of the name. Today, the Science Circle Foundation is a nonprofit organization headed in the Netherlands with an international board of directors and hundreds of members from all over the globe. The mission of the Science Circle is to enhance understanding and learning, uh, to promote, promote uh, dialogue broadly across disciplines with an emphasis on the sciences, using a virtual environment to allow participation on a global scale. Now, I'd like to invite you to uh, visit our website, which I just put up there, um, to learn more about who we are. And better still, come visit us as guests uh, on the Science Circle Sim and Second Life. Our presentations are often on Saturdays at uh, 10 a.m. Second Life time. Now, back in 2008, um, I was honored to give the first presentation for our group on the subject of the Anthropocene epic, that is, how human activity rivals natural processes and an impact on the Earth. For the last uh, five, th 11 years, the Science Circle has met continuously and sponsored hundreds of presentations on extremely wide range of topics shared with us by experts in the field from around the world. We engage not only in active presentations, but uh, explore other regions on field trips to areas as diverse as the Grand Canyon and ancient Abyssinia. We also have a number of interactive and informative spaces on our island. So what do we find exciting? Well, uh, besides the very fact that we have the group and that, that uh, we have members from around the world and can hear from experts, uh, members of the Science Circle yearn to learn more about the world around us. Uh, we have both current students and lifelong learners with decades of life experience. Many of our early members had to kind of uh, suspend their beliefs and uh, those of their colleagues who often dismissed this place as some sort of video game, which we know it's not. On the other hand, we continue to attract much younger members who are digital natives, who grew up communicating remotely, selecting avatars in console or web games, uh, who already kind of get this place. Now, members of our board um, and many of our presenters who are likely to have gray hair in first life, even if their avatars don't, uh, bring decades of experience of, in science and teaching to the world. We've been learning from each other, uh, all generations, about the ever-evolving set of technologies that enable us to represent and to present and to immerse people in the wonders of scientific discovery and knowledge. So it's the perfect place to learn. Let me describe some of the ways we do. Uh, virtual worlds are a perfect place to learn and to learn about science. Uh, learning here involves not just textbooks or static pictures that you look at your own or on your own or passive videos that you watch on the web. Here you can see what a heart or a dolphin 
Zipfen looks like from all angles, what sounds they make, and how they connect with the world. Here, your learning can be guided by experts in the field, from people with whom, li like you, with whom you can interact face to face instead of just watch from a distance. Learning's not just passive, but it's do it yourself. What if I mix the traits of, of the two parents? What will their offspring look like? What if I change the shape of the tires? Will NASA accept my proposal for the new Mars rover? Learning is not just sit and listen presentations, but dynamic and immersive interaction with others where your ideas are heard. Learning is not just professional pres presenters sharing subjects with which they're passionate, but a flurry of text chat among audience members, comments, questions, answers, links, uh, feedback. Learning in the science circle is respectful encounters in which your opinion, your answer, your question counts, regardless of who, who you are in the physical world. Does it matter that it's virtual? Uh, do you remember it any less? I can still recall my first encounters in Second Life, uh, going to a mosque and being asked to t uh, take off my shoes, uh, going to um, other areas uh, and being able to play an instrument uh, in, a, in a Korean village, all these sorts of things. I'm sure you've had these same sorts of experiences. I can remember... Uh, Recall walking among the denizens of the ocean deep, uh, tracing Darwin's footsteps, experiencing an asteroid strike on Mars. I've investigated optical illusions, found my way through jungles, sat with a meerkat in Africa, and witnessed the span of world art in an open museum on our island that spirals ever upward. Both our real world and our virtual worlds can be exciting places and we're still all learning together and that's what really makes it truly exciting so what I would like to do is I'd now like to invite you to hear from our other three presenters we'll share with you today and to learn more about yourself about the science circle come visit us learn how exciting things that we can share with you now one of our uh, presenters will be speaking on what you need to know and I like I said I hope I haven't stepped on <laughs> what they're saying but in, uh, the sci in science and in education, hearing from different perspectives is where the learning technique is. So thank you, and uh, we're coming up on our next speaker. Uh, this is a little about who I am, um, but we'll hear from everyone. And oh, hey there, George from Vermont. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to, I'm a little early, but I'm going to turn it over to uh, the uh, next point. Um, yeah, uh, Vic, let me uh, interject a little bit here. Um, uh, our next uh, speaker will be Stephen Geyser at our West Compass Point. Uh, but uh, just as a housekeeping matter, uh, um, Stephen, do you want me to uh, click the HUD for you, or um, do you want to operate it yourself? Uh, just I'm not sure which, which way is the – okay, you want to do it? I, I think that actually might be a little bit better if you do it yourself. Um, and we have a minute or so uh, on our schedule. Uh, would like to invite our uh, studio audience uh, to text any remarks or uh, thoughts they have on uh, what Vic just said. Any thoughts? Reactions? We've, uh, we've uh, attracted a pretty good sized crowd here today. Looks like we have uh, 40 people, pretty good. Um, all right, uh, uh, with that then, uh, let me introduce uh, Stephen uh, Geyser, uh, Stephen Zotify here in Second Life. Uh, Stephen, why don't you go ahead and um, uh, give, uh, uh, give your remarks. Thank you, nice to be here and have such a nice audience for today. I posted in my uh, background information, and in basics, I am a PhD in molecular biology, but I went and transitioned to teaching, ended up teaching some classes in Second Life at two different public universities, and also helped to try and develop educational activities related to biology in 
Second Life, and Open Simulator. I am now in the private sector, so I'm not currently in education, but I wanted to provide that information uh, for where I came from, and I'm still a very active member in the science circle and trying to, uh, again, maintain that interface with education. Uh, Vic set up a nice east compass point, and actually I think I have the easiest job because talking about what's worrisome for someone like myself is actually pretty easy too. And the basic worries about integrating virtual world science learning into education are the institutional resistances for wide adoption and the user space of these platforms in people's technology interfaces. My experiences in Second Life, uh, before I begin talking about my interactions with Science Circle, I'd like to give some more details about my teaching background. I taught a non-majors biology course fully in the world several semesters. While the grant supporting faculty uh, were very encouraging of the course, the department chair gave grudging permission to actually teach it. It served a very useful role, allowing distance education for the wider student body, i.e. the non-majors. But it was not destined to be a course for wider adoption or to ever teach major classes. There was faculty bias against thinking that major courses could be taught well in Second Life or uh, online at all. Now, wider adoption of Second Life at University of New Orleans also did not happen, even with the grants, outside of a few very good courses in education and English. I also found via feedback that when individual students had a hard time with a particular course or Second Life and commented such on course evaluations, this created a fear of alienating individual students among the faculty, and this created resistance to adoption as well. Now, Ball State was more supportive in general of applying new technologies to the learning experience, and using Open Simulator and Second Life was something I had the encouragement to try out. The IDI lab, the Institute for Digital Intermediate Arts, there uh, is also a world-class immersive media group, which was hosting their Open Simulator Red Grid, which I use for courses. And I forgot to put in the text, they also used to have a, a sim in Second Life. With Kim Anubis, I developed a fully fleshed out virtual epidemiology activity, recreating John Snow's examination of cholera in 1860s London for it. Its development was supported by an internal university grant. However, there was still institutional resistance in that they were very proactive at making sure officially adopted online platforms complied with disability guidelines and laws, which led to Again, a, an institutional resistance to fully adopting uh, virtual worlds courses, activities for courses. And while virtual ability and other talented individuals can help design those for those with physical disabilities, it is an additional development layer and time commitment uh, for the faculty. Now, some other observations. Those have been specific and in individual experiences that inform my worldview or my virtual worldview. However, I will put forward other observations from my time in virtual worlds and points of view from science circle discussions. We can all admit that Second Life and Open Simulator and other platforms are incredibly immersive and powerful for learning. Through my years in world and attending VWP, I've seen many. However, the key question is how many K-12 schools or universities have fully supported these platforms with technical and design personnel? Individual or small group development and implementation, like I've done, helps bring these experiences to usage. However, wide-scale adoption requires more buy-in. One of the keys to training students to use the platform, er, er, that is one of the keys. This is where the robustness of the platforms can hurt adoption because the learning curve is higher. I've personally trained almost all my students to use the viewer. That takes away from instruction and was additional work for me. Institutional inertia. Institutions will, of course, make such efforts if they see the value in the end. Studies that demonstrate learning effectiveness and efficiency will be important for this step. Conferences like this, 
efforts of individuals all helped build this case. Science Circle, with this plan to persistently introduce and expose science learning to individuals and work with institutions, can help advance this case. They can be one of those partners that relieves several burdens, like having to go through purchasing or the design time to set up virtual spaces. I personally use the Science Circle a few times as a study hall location and for presentations. They can be a resource with established land and users that can make things easier for teachers. Platforms. I want to revisit the efficiency effectiveness perspective for learning technologies from the user perspective. There are a lot of options for internet social interactions. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, Snapchat, and Twitter are all popular social platforms. Now they're flat, but they are easy to use. They function in bursts of activity, which lets a person be active without long commitments. They can be on mobile phones and are easy to carry. These platforms are where a lot of people are with their interactions with each other on the internet. Users and universities can and have leveraged these platforms for their ease of use and what they can do well, though limited in scope. For decades, universities have used chat boards, even email, or even snail mail for distance courses. They are easier to implement and can be good instruction with the right instructor and engaged students. They are good in the efficiency effectiveness equation. Virtual worlds are still not perceived that way. Now, Science Circle engagement. The Science Circle has been dedicated for several years to engaging its users and welcoming new users on multiple platforms. These are ways to make sure that you have an engaged community at the levels at which they can commit. In real presentations are recorded and posted to YouTube, for example. They have their own dedicated web page and are on Facebook and LinkedIn. Science Circle is also supporting an open simulator grid. Of course, for any social media platform, one is competing against lots of information vying for each user's attention. It is important to be ready to compete against those other distractions, and that is a danger of using other company spaces. They ultimately do control the interface and the user agreements. So as a final suggestion, and a reminder of what the Science Circle is trying to do, is that what we've learned over the years is it's best to find ways to partner with those who know what they're doing and have what you need to ease the transition into virtual worlds. Draw users in and engage on multiple platforms, and you have to meet people at what they're comfortable using and doing, but also make it easier for yourself. And that is the uh, end of my comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. That was uh, uh, very thorough. Appreciate that very much. Um, do we have any uh, um, thoughts from our uh, audience? Um, I do think that uh, it's. Um, it still, frankly, does kind of surprise me uh, how, um, uh, I guess, just how long or how slow it's been to uh, sort of get uh, educational institutions to accept a platform like Second Life, um, even in view of the you know, decade of experience with it and uh, um, and how um, uh, how versatile and um, how versatile it can be, and what kind of the kind of interesting demographics uh, you can attract to these platforms. Okay, um, so we're doing pretty well on time. Our um, our next speaker at the uh, North Compass Point is going to be Mike Shaw. Um, Mike, would you like to operate your own Speakeasy HUD, or would you like me to uh, click on it for you? Um, I, I can click on it. Um, my uh, my my talk is uh, going to be my my talk is uh, I thought well prepared, but I I tend to uh, make live changes to to things, so it'll probably be a little bit better for me to um, go and go. So. Um, yeah. I've really enjoyed um, um, Phil and uh, Stephen's presentations. It brings up a lot of um, excellent points, um, you know, especially about um, the challenges that we face um, in implementing education in um, um, virtual worlds and um, 
things like that. Um, well, um, I'm Mike Shaw. Uh, my uh, background here is um, coming through on uh, text chat here. Uh, it's, I'm at a medium-sized university. It's called Southern Illinois University uh, Edwardsville. We've got about 14,000 students. We're in the Midwest. I say um, no uh, PhD program. My teaching load's a bit um, higher than what you would expect at a, um, a PhD program. But good funding opportunity especially like using research as a teaching experience for our students. Um, so um, it's been a good platform for me for, um, being able to do the kind of things I wanted to do in my career. So I've ended up being kind of um, um, senior here now. One of the interesting things about being more senior is that um, people just kind of let you do a little more than um, what they might let a junior team member do. You know, there's there's the tenure thing, and it's like, well, about him anyway. Um, so I've had some uh, good success in introducing some uh, second life classes, more as um, demonstrations and animations and the like, science circle to help. Um, my compass point today. Let's see. I'll have to click on the. Speak e easy. My compass point today I wanted to address was how can expert presenters such as scientists um, and others be engaged in virtual worlds on a continuing basis? Um, and uh, we've touched on that a little bit. Uh, time management is is a, an important institutional support is a. So I like to um, think about what. Um, the definitions are in any question that I'm answering. So the first thing that comes up for me is like, what counts as an expert presenter? And honestly, in um, our experience in a uh, science circle, you don't have to be um, like a PhD chemist to be able to present. Um, it does help if you have um, good credentials, but if you have a lot of knowledge on it's welcome. Okay. So uh, we have regular presentations from scientists, educators, uh, MD, people with um, unique experience and perspective. So a very broad definition. So getting back to the question, okay, how can um, experts be engaged? Um, you always have to look at both internal motivations and external motivations. If somebody is internally motivated, um, it basically means that uh, the, the reward that uh, for the activity is a reward that comes from the inside, a general sense of satisfaction from, from the activity itself. So, you know, that can come from a variety of sources. I mean, creating in Second Life is fun. Engaging with others to promote science because of one's own personal beliefs, that's also um, fun and satisfying. Um, you know, building good, supportive relationships. One of the things I found in Science Circle is that I've made a lot of friends, and um, that would not have happened. Um, that would not have happened uh, without uh, the interaction I've had in uh, Science Circle. Uh, so, you know, basically, all these are um, internal motivations, which essentially boil down like it feels like the right. Um, so I've, I've been giving uh, presentations for a couple of years now in Science Circle. I'm not one of the early adopters. I've been in Second Life for a uh, decade, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, you know, I've been, enjoyed the time here, but it's become a lot more fun with uh, the more social interaction. Okay? So um, external motivations. Well, how can we bribe people? And I use the word bribe as, you know, basically getting uh, can be thought of as a bribe, and if it's not, then you're internally motivated. Yay! Um, for me, uh, there are definitely uh, rewards here. Um, let's say that I'm out at work about the Second Life thing. I put it in my annual report. I get reviewed on it. I get good reviews on it. Uh, my colleagues are uh, supportive. Um, and, um, you know, basically, so there are uh, professional rewards. Being specific, um, 
let's say um, that uh, one is applying for external funding as a scientist. In uh, NSF, there is the uh, broader impact criterion that has to be addressed in every proposal. Uh, um, I, in the fall, I submitted two proposals. Uh, one was funded, one was not. One was for my chemistry activities. Um, I, uh, I don't think I've shared this with anybody in Science Circle yet, but um, the chemistry one has a little bit of money in it for um, helping Science Circle pay for land use. So that's uh, a three-year commitment there. And, uh, you know, basically NSF was very supportive of that. Not a huge amount but every little bit helps. So, um, yeah, uh, international, international conference, I am going to, uh, I am going to uh, write it that way. So, um, you know, one thing being a faculty member at a university like mine, external funding uh, gives you a lot of credibility. So uh, that helps with Science Circle. Stuff. The, uh, the other proposal was not funded. Um, it was basically with some of the people in this room, virtual room, um, and um, basically we we're going to get uh, questions of how to um, make, how to make objects a little more pedagogically friendly um, in Second Life teaching. Basically build the pedagogy into uh, objects and animations before we um, just build the objects. That one wasn't funded, but uh, reviews are encouraged. So that's a very good professional stuff. Um, you know, we basically make the normal presentations on science into an activity that uh, count towards uh, funding. I think that's a good strategy. Increases chances of funding. Um, Next point, partnering with others in Second Life allows for collaboration. So that was the uh, point of the second uh, proposal that we uh, put in in uh, the fall. Um, and since we have unique population demographics of residents of virtual worlds, that can be uh, very attractive for certain studies. Invited talks go on resume. That speaks to uh, Phil's comment uh, a little bit earlier. Um, and one of the most wonderful things I found is that the objects uh, that I've designed for talks in Second Life do double duty. I can um, uh, use them in my classroom as animated 3 Some of my students go into um, Second Life. Them. They're the minority because, um, as Stephen pointed, there are institutional barriers. Um, oh, lost voice for a second there. Uh, we do have uh, policies where uh, you can't require students to make um, external program like uh, Second Life. So, um, you know, all of these, all of these activities. Um, you know, count as uh, science outreach on the um, annual report. Okay, so I was going to uh, res uh, something at this point, but you can guys can come to the uh, the science uh, circle site and see some of some of our um, some of our objects. Okay, annual report. Um, you know, one of the things that I found uh, for external motivations, the most engaged presenters seem to have a common or balance of interaction and external mode. So you're seeing have both and external science circle. One of the big things is time commitments. Um, if I am going over, uh, Matt, just stop me and I'll activate an animation that makes me stop. Um, the bride. Uh, I think I'll... we still have you still have a minute, so you're okay. Perfect. Okay, let's look at time commitments. We talked about time commitments a little bit. Um, it takes a lot of time to um, uh, come up with uh, much of this stuff, and I'll just kind of click through and go through some of the uh, highlights here. There are things competing for one's time. Okay, the regular teaching activities, the lab time. 
with one's students. There's service. The rest of my day today is service. And then there's home, because there is, there is the home that has to, has to remain standing. So it is important, and I put little plus signs around this, there is a balance um, that includes science outreach. That means you have to carve time out so that you get synergies with the existing time commitments and activities. So I think I'm going to stop there. Yeah. And, but um, let's go with, let's go. Let's um, yes, uh, thank you very much. That was a, a really enjoyable uh, presentation. <clears throat> uh, I discovered my, uh, my wall clock is about 30 seconds slower than the uh, computer time. So uh, got us a little bit behind there, but I think it was worth it. Um, and now, uh, yes, and so our next uh, presenter is going to be uh, Rob Knopp. So, Rob. Uh, All right. Please, and you know what? I will go, go ahead and go. try and click, and we'll see if it works. Hey, look, okay. it works. I'll use it. So, uh, hello, everybody. I am Rob Knopp, currently a physics professor at Westminster College, a small college in western Pennsylvania. And I'm going off script already. I just wanted to echo what Mike said. He said that he tends to rewrite his presentations as he gives them. Yes, I do that too. In fact, usually when I prepare presentations, I don't have any kind of a script. I have slides. I know what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and then I make it all up when I get there. So here I am doing the same thing. Um, my claim to fame from years past, I was part of one of the two teams of astronomers that discovered the expansion of our universe is accelerating. So that was back in the late 1990s is when that happened in 2011. The guy I worked with, Saul Perlmutter, got the Nobel Prize for that. So there's my claim to fame. Um, maybe, however, I'm more famous around here because uh, I took two years off from academia, worked at this small company called Linden Lab as a uh, operations engineer and later as the server release manager. And I was Prospero Linden back then. And some of you may have known me back then as Prospero Linden. But that's been a long time. Uh, I think you can still look up Prospero Linden's profile, so the account hasn't been deleted, but whatever. And I will say Prospero Phobos was the name I had before that and that I still use for my Second Life avatar. But people mostly call me Rob nowadays. Um, the other thing that happened when I was at Linden Lab is I became a founding member of MICA, although some people thought it should be called MICA, the Meta Institute of Computational Astronomy. This was put together by a number of astronomers. Some you, uh, Curious George, George Dragovsky is still sort of around. Uh, Pete Hutt was another one. Uh, there were a few others as well. And what we were really trying to do was create a, um, well, I'll tell you, but you know what? I'm going, see, I'm going out of order here. I shouldn't do that. So since then, I've been on the faculty at a couple of small colleges, including where I am now. And yes, I still give public outreach talks. Now, in association with the science circle, um, I used to give a lot more during the time of MICA. Nowadays, it's more like two or three a year, and it depends on how good Chantal and Jess are at convincing me to actually get my act together and do one. So very broadly speaking, my topics on the question, does crosstalk between Second Life and other media make meeting in virtual worlds for science discussion more robust? You're going to hear some echoes of some things people have already said here because, hey, we're all talking about kind of the same thing. So as I was saying, Micah, uh, I think Micah's experience is relevant. Its goal was to explore virtual worlds like Second Life as a collaboration platform for astronomers. We called it computational astronomy because several of the, that's just the research area that several of them were in. So we did have in Micah, a number of professional astronomers, other than just those of us who founded it, come in and give colloquia. But our experience was none of them, I don't think any one of them, stayed in Second Life. A few of them came back a couple of times, and that was about it. Uh, the only regulars who stayed with us were the core group that uh, either founded it or were with it from the very beginning. So, you know, that was a little discouraging. Now, here's the thing, though. Astronomy as a whole has been very eager to adopt a lot of Internet technology. We had a better journal search engine in the late 1990s, which still exists, adsabs.harvard.edu. Um, it's better than what a lot of fields had even a few years ago. And in fact, still today, I'd rather use that than the ones I find on libraries and things. It's a very good search engine term. Also, virtual observatories. Curious George, George Shergovsky, has worked a lot on this. There's large surveys out there. And there are software and websites where people can um, point at places on the sky and then get all the data from large surveys. So it's not that astronomy 
has resisted adopting technology, but virtual worlds have not had much of a pickup with astronomers. And like I said, we tried and we didn't really get so far. And so from that point of view, we could view MICA as a failure because we didn't really create an astronomy department in Second Life. We don't, don't still have ongoing professional astronomers coming in and having seminars with each other. Now, when I was involved in MICA, um, uh, yeah, uh, Enrico, I don't remember what he called himself, but anyway, yes, um, he's still around. Um, I would say, you know, just as an aside, from my own point of view, I picked up collaborators that I met in Second Life through MICA. Um, I, at least one of them, yes, thank you, at least one of them uh, wrote me a recommendation letter when I applied for a job. I still communicate with some of the others. Uh, the research I'm doing is related to some of that. So it was very productive for me personally. It just didn't seem to catch on and catch fire. Now, my role in MICA was I gave a lot of public outreach talks. For a while, I was giving one almost every week, which is hard for me to imagine nowadays. Uh, Mike was talking about, it takes time to put these things together. Well, I was doing a lot once. Um, so from my selfish point of view, and of course I am very biased here, the most successful part of MICA was the public outreach talks. And like I say, they continue to this day. MICA no longer formally exists, but the science circle, of course, has picked up and is, is the, it does public outreach talks in all sorts of different scientific fields. They're still going, I still do them, and I think they work very well. But I'm not aware of any, any really meaningful scientific collaboration amongst astronomers in virtual worlds. So, all right, so what's the issue? Why doesn't it work? I think that the barriers for getting into Second Life, and if anything more so into OpenSim uh, worlds, remain huge, gigantic. It's just, uh, it's hard. When I worked at Linden Lab, we had noticed that the number of people who boot up the client and the number of people who log into Second Life a second time, there's a gigantic drop between those two. And if anything, between then and now, I think people's patience for getting going with technology has gone down. Think about apps on phones, right? People expect to pick up their phone, uh, touch a touch screen, and, and they see their thing. Uh, the notion that you might have to spend a minute or two figuring out how to do a thing, I think, is getting farther and farther from uh, what people do. So there's a little parenthetical element for you. Now, in MICA, some of us felt that the immersion of virtual worlds, which the other folks have already talked about, brought a lot to the collaboration. Um, I'm not, I think we were in the minority. I think most people found the barriers getting involved and the, um, the remove you're at with your avatar as opposed to yourself did not, those overwhelmed or overcame the immersion that it was worth it. And Stephen was talking about, um, oh, I should say, there's other collaboration and communication tools like the web for sharing preprints is huge. But Mike was talking about well, Mike and Stephen, I think, both talked about trying to get college students involved is tough. Stephen, I think, mentioned he had to sit down and work with each and every student to get them going with the viewer. Um, trying to get college students to do anything other than silently sit and maybe take notes is hard. And so when you have them going into, to, you know, we try to do active learning and the students, you have to cajole sometimes. So that's kind of tough, right? So what does work? Well, public outreach to those who are interested in virtual worlds. And so what I would say I see my mission with the public outreach talks I do nowadays is bringing science to people who are in Second Life, which, as has been pointed out, are people all over the world. So it's, it's less we want to try and recruit people into virtual worlds so they can hear my talks and more, hey, there's a lot of people already in virtual worlds, and a lot of them are interested in science, and so great, I want to do outreach to them. Uh, and that's, I think, at least part of what Science Circle wants to do. Um, I will say, secondarily, people watch Science Circle YouTube videos. You can ask Chantal for more information about that. She knows she has numbers and things. It could well be that more people see my talks on YouTube than come into Second Life and see them. But honestly, I think the interactivity of the talks is part of what's really important about them. Vic mentioned this. In our Science Circle talks, there's always a um, ongoing chat in text as we're talking, as people ask questions, and then I answer questions, or I'll tell you, frankly, usually Vic answers the question, right? Uh, they'll talk to each other, they'll answer each, answer each other's questions, I will respond. It's very interactive, and I think that's an important part of it. And if you're just watching a video of the talk later, you don't get to participate in that interaction. And so I think that's actually a pretty important part of it. So that's the end of my 
prepared notes. I will just say to summarize, Science Circle, what I see is its mission mainly is outreach to the people around the world who already are in virtual worlds. There's a tremendous potential for bringing other people into it, but what's working best right now is talking to the people who are there. So, I will stop there and let Berrigan take it all over. Fantastic. That was uh, really thought-provoking. Um... Um, we now have a little bit of time for a general discussion, um, and um, uh, uh, and bef uh, and I want to do I want to make take a moment here um, uh, to make sure I have time for it. Um, let's all please uh, uh, applaud and give acknowledgement to Chantal and Jess who worked so hard to. Uh, pull this presentation together and line up uh, all of our panel members um, and to coordinate with the VWPPB. Um, uh, so uh, thank you so much, Chantal and Jess. And I know, Jess, it must be like 5 o'clock in the morning for you in Australia. So uh, we appreciate your sacrifice to be here today. Um, uh, and. I think um, I'll, I'll take a look at our local chat here. A couple of things I'm curious about with regard to the entry barriers is what impact the mesh revolution has had um, uh, for whether mesh makes Second Life easier to access or more difficult to access. I kind of feel like mesh has professionalized building in Second Life so much of creating objects for Second Life is now done offline in Photoshop and so forth and imported in. The building tools um, seem to be used, the, the in-world building tools seem to be less and less. And in some ways that can make it easier. You can just sort of get something and wear it or, or put it on your land or something. But it does seem like you see less in-world building happening. Well, I'll jump in and uh, agree with you. Um, the mesh makes things look a lot less uh, cartoony than they did in the old days. And I think that may have been uh, something that turned people off initially. And a uh, wonderful thing about mesh is that uh, you can build it. It's offline, but you can use it in different venues. Um, so, in fact, we use... Um, Oh, Google Cardboard uh, devices using Unity that uh, we build mesh um, objects for so students can actually see these things in class without having to log on to an actual virtual world. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, I, I would also, while I have the floor here, make a plug for the Science Circle and our Saturday programs, and in particular our the panel discussions that I moderate. Um, I think one of the speakers here mentioned the social aspects of the science community uh, here in Second Life. And uh, I think one of the things that our Science Circle panel discussions bring out uh, is a, a little bit of a more, a less formal, um, very more social way to, um, to present uh, scientific topics. So I just wanted to make a plug for that. Yeah, let me jump in real quick to talk about interactive objects because I made a bunch of chemistry stuff. And one of the challenges is how do you translate the in world activity into a grade that you can document in your gradebook? And I think that that is one of the challenges that is uh, you know, persistently present. And that in terms of designing them, you might try and find a way to design them in a way that they are tracking the progress or how you score them ultimately. Um, if I can jump in for just a second, uh, one of the classes I did in Second Life, I did with a professor in France, with students in France, United States, and Mexico, and they got together, uh, used whatever language they want. Uh, we were, it was a class in Java, so essentially they were learning uh, scripting in Second Life, creating objects like robots and cars and a jukebox and stuff, and so that's kind of how we translated things and so we could grade, uh, grade stuff. Okay, fantastic. Um, and uh, my clock says uh, it's uh, eleven twenty, pretty much exactly. So why don't we go ahead and and gavel this uh, 
present this panel discussion to a close. I want to thank all of our panel members for all the work they put in to, um, uh, to, for their uh, for their presentations, um, and to you know just to be able to all get organized enough to all be here together. So thanks to everyone, and again thanks to Chantal and Jess. And with that, I um, gaveled this to a close, and you're all free to go. Okay, uh, we, this is just, of course, the first uh, presentation, so have fun at the rest of the conference. This is a great conference.